Greetings, this is Angela Blue Skies, and I am so delighted to be here today with my dear sister, Ashley Latecki Ellenboss. She has been in my life for a number of years in a number of ways, and she is doing so many amazing things in the world, and the presence that she holds is just such a gift. Ashley is a clinical herbalist living in the Maryland suburbs of Washington, D.C., in addition to seeing clients, Ashley teaches classes in herbal medicine and medicine making through the Sky House Herb School, as well as one and two year herbal apprenticeship programs. She is also guest faculty at the Maryland University of Integrated Health. Ashley, it is so wonderful to be here together with you today. It's so nice to be here with you as well. I'm really excited for the show. I think it's just such a nice blessing that you're giving to the community. Thank you. So I believe that our topic today is perfect for the time that we're living in right now. We're all being forced to slow down because of the pandemic, and many people are called more than ever to engage with Pachamama through growing gardens and foraging in the wild. Today we're going to talk about herbs as friends and spiritual allies, truly one of my favorite conversations. For some though, thinking of plants as something we can relate to in a personal way might be a leap. Can you share a little more about that, Ashley? Sure. Yeah. And I think it's, it is a great time to be talking about herbs and to be thinking about them in a different way. Um, yeah, I think most of us, when we think about herbal medicines, we think about how does, how do we use this? And I encourage my students to think about not just how do we use something, but you know, what does this have to offer? Because you wouldn't go up to a person that you just met and say, hi, what are you good for? <laughs> like, how can I <laughs> use you? You know, like that would not be very polite and um, you probably would not get very much from that. So with plants, you know, the way that I see them as beings, you know, they are, um, they've been on this planet much longer than we have. They've adapted to the earth environment for um, 472 million years. And that's like, you know, 275 million years longer than the very first um, mammal that walked on the earth. So they're like double, they have double the experience of our earliest ancestors and how to survive on earth. So to me, they're my elders. I mean, they are wise, intelligent creatures that have adapted and are sensitive. And I think that's one thing that people don't might not know either is that plants can sense. They, they might not have the same senses that we do as humans, but they can sense touch, they can sense changes in temperature, um, they can sense color changes and um, just a number of different things. And there's been increasing studies showing how responsive plants are to their environment and, um, and how they communicate. So, you know, if we think about the things that make something kind of alive in our eyes, um, you know, the, the ability to communicate and to adapt and to perceive are all some of the characteristics we associate with a living being. And so plants really are, they are living beings. And, and I think we all will benefit from treating them in that way and we'll actually get much more medicine and information from them. I love it. It's such an important point of view um, in coming into respect with the other beings that share this world with us. And I'm curious, how did you first begin to connect with herbs and herbal medicine? Well, as a child, I was outside a lot. I grew up in the um, suburbs of Maryland. And so my mom would kick us out and tell us to go play outside. And so a lot of my childhood was spent outside making little worlds out of moss and little terrariums and building spaceships in the trees. So I think from a young age, I really loved the natural world and being in nature. Um, and then I started having some health issues. Um, I had asthma, a lot of allergies, digestive issues. So my mom took me to a naturopath who put me on a vegetarian diet. And this was at the age of 12, I think, wow. 12 or 13. So yeah, so I, I went off dairy. I became a vegetarian. I started taking herbs and doing homeopathy and um, it changed my life. I, I felt like I woke up out of some fog, some sort of um, inflammatory fog and um, 
that really, that really changed my life. And I, I, from that moment, I was like, I want to help other people to feel good too, to, to feel like they can wake up. Um, I originally went into environmental science, you know, I, I loved the plants and I love the environment and I thought, how can I help the plants? How can I help them live? And how can I, you know, help people by helping plants? But what ended up happening in my training was I realized that the planet isn't the thing that needed helping. It was really the people. So I shifted focus and started to study um, integrative health studies and went on to get my master's in clinical herbal medicine, thinking that if I can teach people about the plants and have people value them and see their inherent intrinsic worth, then they're not going to damage the environment. And then that's not going to affect them negatively. So I kind of, you know, I had a number of different kind of divergent paths that, that ended up taking me into herbal medicine. And so you went to the Thai Sophia Institute. I did. Yeah. It's now called Maryland University of Integrative Health. But when I was there in 2005 to 2008, it was then Thai Sophia. Such a beautiful place that I spent quite a bit of time before it pivoted to their new mission. And um, I am so grateful that there's such a wonderful program that is right here in the greater Washington, D.C. area, teaching people how to be in deep relationship with the elements and with nature and with these incredibly powerful healing modalities that come from such a different point of view as allopathic medicine does. Absolutely. And, you know, they have the benefit too of, um, they're, they're an acupuncture school, a nutrition school, and an herb school. So, you know, when you're in that environment, um, you know, the energetics of Chinese medicine are kind of in the air along with the medicine of the plant. So it is a very, it's a very informative um, place to study. Awesome. So you were already talking about this a little bit um, earlier in our conversation. Um, lots of people are familiar with herbal medicines being used in much the same way as allopathic medicines. Certain herbs are being used for certain health conditions. And the way that you approach the relationship with herbs is so different. And I wonder if you could say a little bit more about what being in relationship with an herb or a plant means to you. Yeah, yeah. So to me, being in relationship with a plant is seeing it for, for who it is, you know, for, for who or what, if that feels more comfortable, um, but seeing it in its totality. So to me, that means knowing what it looks like and studying the features of its physical body. You know, what is the leaf pattern? What does the flower, how does the flower grow? Um, what color is it? Um, also, where does the plant grow? You know, does it live in a dry environment versus a moist environment? Um, and uh, yeah, like what, what friends does it like to keep company with? You know, who, who does it surround itself with? And all of those things will tell you a lot about the plant. And um, there's a very ancient practice called the doctrine of signatures. And this was way, you know, before the time even of Hippocrates, but this idea that plants have this sort of secret arcana or this secret, uh, these symbols that they possess in their structures. And if we can study them and study these patterns, looking at color and shape and even movement and, and niche, we can then get to know some of the deeper qualities of the plant. Um, so, so the doctrine of signatures was revitalized in, by Paracelsus in the 1700s and is now being revitalized by teachers like Matthew Wood and um, Sean Donahue and Margie Flint. And so, you know, we're seeing this resurgence of, of this very ancient way of seeing plants coming for, forth. And um, that's one of the ways that, that I work in relationship with them. And to me, I, I always look at them holistically. So I look at that energetic pattern that they give. I try to look at um, historical information. How has the plant been used throughout time? But also what's the latest data? Because I want to know as a little bit of a science nerd, like what chemicals are in these plants? And like, mm. what do we know about them from the, from the more minute level? And uh, they often all go together. So that's been the coolest thing about my studies of herbs is that you know, you, you can actually integrate in the energetics and the chemistry very well because tannins are very astringent. And this plant has been known to be a drying herb for some time. Um, and then it has signature of, of growing in a very wet place, which has made it avail, uh, able to um, 
have things that, that kind of keep it dry so it doesn't get waterlogged. So you can actually see how, wow, all of these things can be tied together and we don't have to just go folk or just go science. We can actually do a blend. Um, and so that's how I like to see the totality of the plant. And then I relate with it in that way. And some of my clients, they're you know, what's going on with them is more energetic. It is more of a subtle body thing. And so they, for that kind of work, <clears throat> the more subtle qualities of the plant are going to speak a little bit louder. Um, where if it's something purely physiological, which it never truly is purely, but if it's, mo if they're looking for just more physiological support, then I can go to my, you know, my background in chemistry and say, okay, well, what are the compounds here that would actually, you know, estrange those tissues or, you know, you know, help facilitate tissue repair. And, um, and then that all can be kind of blended together. I love it. And you know, what strikes me um, is that even the folk medicine traditions were science. They were the science of their day. Totally. And we just don't understand that science in our culture anymore. And we've lost our appreciation for those ways of approaching it. Yeah, absolutely. So in terms of being spiritual allies, how do you personally work with herbs? Mm. I mean, they're, they're, they're like friends. And, and I, I did a, a, a talk at the very kind of beginning of, of COVID, the COVID outbreak um, of like, to me, when I look around my yard or I'm walking outside, like I don't see green things. I see friends. I see like I'm like, oh, good morning, Comfrey. Good morning, Rue. You know, good morning, Chamomile. And and I just feel like I, you know, I have so many friends because I, I know their names and I know something about them. I've created a relationship with them. So, um, you know, to me, I think on on a on a spiritual level, um, you know, when I'm feeling sometimes I'm feeling drawn to a certain plant. I don't really understand it fully, but there's something in me that's just, it keeps showing up in my life. Like, oh, wow, yarrow again, you know, or like, you know, there's some, like some recurring themes and then I'll look it up or do some more research and I'll think, oh, that's why. And to me, like, that's, that's a, a spiritual message. That's the plant or that energy connecting with me and having something to say to me in dialogue. Um, and yeah, I've had just, I've had so many experiences with the herbs in my own body and with clients and students over the years that have just affirmed for me that, that these beings work on such deep levels. I mean, they can change patterns that felt insurmountable um, and, and make huge life and lifestyle changes um, that, you know, you, you, you couldn't even dream of. And so to me, it's just these, these plants full of this life force, full of this intelligence, uh, just um, they, they, they want to support us, they want to help. And, you know, I think when the more open you are, the, the more multidimensional type of healing you can get from them. I love it. So one of the plants that was in my life as like my favorite since I was a small child was rose. And I was obsessed with rose. Uh, my elementary school was named Rosemont. <laughs> nice. I loved it because it had rose in it. And when they closed that school because they didn't have enough funding to keep it open, I was so devastated because what are they going to do with the rose? And so this appeared throughout my life. And when I was in Peru working with one of my, um, my mentors there, he would come to me and do healing with me singing songs of the rose. And I always thought that was interesting, but I never really talked about it. And I worked with him for many years and he came to me once and he said, you need to work with this plant because it's in your field. Um, and I was so blown away by that because it had been with me my whole life. So I made the time the next year to go back to Peru and work with him in a process called dieta. Um, where I would be in seclusion and following a very restricted diet and like no physical contact with other people and just drinking this rose tea. And it was a very particular rose from the Sacred Valley and that also grows in the Amazon that he was having me work with. And it changed my life. I mean, plants have changed my life in many ways already, but this process was so deep and it awakened the connection with my ancestors that I did not see coming. And that has completely reshaped the course of my life. So I love, 
I love the work that you're doing with people, helping them to connect with these deeper um, relational ways that we can be with plants. Like, what a beautiful gift. Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, I love, I love that. That's such a beautiful story and how these plants are in our field. And when we, when we actually take the time to work with them and, and really give them our attention, you know, really actually say, I'm here, you know, I'm here to engage with you. Like, yeah, what, what's possible, what opens. So that's, that's a great example. Thank you for sharing that. Oh, my pleasure. So I'm curious for you in a relational sense, who are some of your closest plant allies? Can you tell? Oh boy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've dated a lot of plants in my life. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, yeah, the ones that like are kind of like closest to me right now, um, Rue is one that has been a longtime ally, but just continues to be kind of front and center for me. And um, that plant comes through a number of different ways into my life, but mostly through my ancestry as Sicilian. Um, and in the Sicilian tradition, Rue, uh, which is also called Ruta graviolens, is the Latin name, um, but spelled R-U-E. And Rue, um, they grow, grow it outside of homes in Sicily to protect against the evil eye. And I know this is also used in like Mexico and in South America, but it's used in, in the um, Sicilian tradition, yeah, to protect against the evil eye, which is also jealousy. And so it, um, yeah, it just sort of, it, it protects your energy field so that um, what other people's perceptions are and judgments are of you don't affect you or don't really, you know, um, yeah, don't, don't make an impact that will really throw you off. And so, um, you know, as I've, been taking more students on and I, you know, I had a very public role for, for many years. Um, I just felt like I just loved having that plant energy near me and I grow it in my garden and it's definitely like a favorite of mine to just watch come up every year and just, oh, it's just, it's very, very, very powerful. And then um, Yarrow is another one that I've been connecting with more in the last few years. And Yara is another protector medicine, um, but it's also one, you know, one of my teachers, Margie Flint, said it's like a big goddess sort of standing behind you being like, I've got your back. And I feel like in these times, um, yeah, there's a lot of pressure on us as women to, to do so much, especially during COVID. It's like there's even more kind of pressure on us to produce or maintain certain things. And um, yarrow regulates blood flow, so it helps keep things moving so things don't get stuck. And that's one of the risks of COVID now, especially with younger people, is, is stroke. So it actually can kind of prevent, in some way, kind of prevent that. Um, it's also a really great wound healer, so it can be used topically um, to really speedily heal up wounds. And I've had some crazy things I've done to myself in the garden, and I've just slapped yarrow on, and it's just <laughs> like, the next day, it's like nothing happened. Like, how is that possible? So um, so it has that quality as well. Um, so yeah, that those two plants are kind of, I think, closest to me at, at this time. I love it. I used to grow rue in my garden, and I first came to it because it was a dye plant. Mm, uh, and yes. I, not that I ever dyed anything with it. I left it alone and just, but I loved it. I loved the, the silvery blue color of the leaves. And they, they almost looked like, I don't know, like some kind of prehistoric shape in the way the leaves are. If, so if our listeners don't know Rue, please look it up. Such a beautiful, beautiful plant. Um, thank you for bringing Rue into this conversation. I haven't, I haven't grown one in a long time. Yeah. yeah. And it's not that hard. It's not that hard to grow. You can grow it in a pot or in a garden and it's just a, yeah, it's a very almost kind of otherworldly plant, you know, it has, um, yeah, that kind of ghosty kind of silvery leaves that, um, and there's a, it's scent is like nothing else. I've never, there's nothing else even compares. So the leaves have just, yeah. Like once you smell it and get to know it, you're like, it's like forever stamped in you. Yeah. Well, mine is still growing in Ellicott City, Maryland, in the garden I left behind. Nice. And I, I am sad that I can't grow more things where I live now because it's so stony here and plants just can't get a root hold and they die so quickly. So I have temporarily stopped trying mm -hmm. anything that's not in a pot. Sure. Yeah. Someday. <laughs> um, someday when we install lots of garden beds, Rue will come back into my heart. 
So many years ago, when I started to develop an interest in herbs and herbal medicine, I started just reading a lot of books that were kind of like plant encyclopedias. And I still have them. Like, I think I must have been 19 or 20 when I first started buying books like that. It was before the internet had grown to the point that you could have that information online. Um, but through many years of connecting with plant healing traditions in the Amazon, I've been exposed to such a different way of learning, like I shared about before. And uh, I'm curious, when you guide your students and apprentices in connecting with plant allies, how do you teach them that? Yeah, yeah, I think there's, um, I mean, there's the Western kind of way that we're trained to learn, which is, you know, you have all these subjects, and then there's a linear way that you move through them. And that's valid, you know, that's, that's a good way to learn. Um, but there's another way that, you know, we could call it Eastern or maybe a more traditional model, which is just immerse immersion. <laughs> you just immerse yourself in all the material and certain bits soak in at different times and you just stay in the water until you've absorbed everything you can. So in my program, I, I do a blend of those. And um, that's how I've done my own learning is, you know, I took a very rigorous, you know, master's of science program. It was, you know, three years long, full time. Um, and then I started just growing herbs and spending time with Matthew Wood and just sitting at his feet and trying to soak in <laughs> just his brilliance <laughs> as much as possible. And, um, but one way that I, I really think my students benefit uh, from learning about plants is doing plant diets. So it's kind of like what you mentioned of your work with Rose, the dieta, uh, modeled in a similar way where um, I have the students um, we have a schedule of plants and we, we do a diet of one to two plants per month mm -hmm. for a minimum of two weeks each. And so they don't take any new herbs during that time and they just work with that plant and they journal and they take note of their dreams and changes and energy or rhythms. And then we discuss that as a group, you know, how is it, you know, what's showing up, what's changing, what's shifting. And, um, and the students really learn a lot because, and, and I, this was something that my husband, who did a lot of work with shamans and in Peru as well said that the, the shamans would say to him is that once you have a, once you've dieted a plant or once you know it in that deep way, it's in you forever. And you don't even need to take the plant in. You can just call in its name and that energy will come back. It'll be right mm -hmm. there with you. So I tell my students that, you know, like if you really commit to these plant diets, like that herb will be, it'll become a part of you. And then you will, you know, maybe, it, for some of them, you know, recalling it and getting a, a boost might not be accessible, but they'll be able to recall that memory of, oh yeah, this nettles really helped me with these things. And now they're coming back again. Nettles, you know, let me bring nettles in again. And then they can start to employ it or they see someone else outside of them who has the same exact pattern that they had when they started nettles and it went away for them. So they remember, so it's in their body. Um, so, you know, I think for most people here in the West, it's a blend of both that seems to really get, you know, help people soak in this information. Yeah, I love that it's experiential learning uh, and not just intellectual learning. Like, I, I feel like so much of our education systems in the U.S. are missing that and yeah. that embodied direct experience. Um, I mean, I'm trained as a musician and the only kind of uh, way you can learn an instrument is through direct embodied experience. So um, what a wonderful way to learn and what a wonderful way to grow as a human being and cultivating that way of learning too. Yeah, yeah, I think they, I think they do really get that embodied element. And then we also, you know, I take them on herb walks and, you know, get, show them the plants and, and try to help them engage. We do botany too. So they get, um, you know, we go through all of the different plant families and then their homework is to go outside and identify them in their own space. So yeah, I try as much as I can to get them, you know, in direct contact with the plants because yeah, there's just no other way to really, really get it in. Awesome. And so you were talking a little bit before about the pandemic in Yarrow, and I'm wondering if we can just pivot in that direction a little bit more deeply. Um, during the pandemic, there's a lot of misinformation. And unfortunately, there is much division within the holistic wellness community about alternative medicine approaches to healing COVID-19. And um, I've kind of just watched on the edge a little horrified because there's not enough 
rigorous science together with people's ideas sometimes. And one of the things I appreciate so much about your work is that you really bring together a deeply sensitive and intuitive approach with rigorous scientific inquiry. What are your thoughts about herbal medicine and COVID-19? Yeah, this is a big, this is a big topic. And it's one that like, I sometimes, you know, it's, it's like, I'll feel like I'm making progress and understanding it. And then things change. Like recently, it's just the Washington Post article coming out with a whole new list of um, symptoms associated with COVID, like, kin like kidney injury and um, kidney disease. That's uh, sort of a secondary um, sort of a, a part of the infection. So it's, yeah, it's a really hard one. It's a very sneaky, very tricky, very intelligent virus. So um, I think a lot of us are really on our toes with it, trying to figure out well, what is it doing and, and how do we get to know it? Um, I think the biggest thing that as an herbalist that I, um, there's a few approaches that I have been taking personally for myself and my family and, um, and then, you know, offering to my students. Um, and, you know, the main one is just keeping your immune system strong and healthy. So, I mean, it's just, it, that's like the most common sense thing we can all do right now is, you know, take the things that keep you relaxed because um, there was actually one study that was um, shown, um, it showed that, they exposed people to um, to a virus. They, they did like a placebo group, placebo group, and they exposed them to a virus. And then they took someone, they took a group of people who were exposed to something that made them angry. And it actually showed that that people that are angry, their immune system is suppressed five times to that who are, are sort of at baseline. Wow. And, you know, I was thinking like, oh, fear and tension and anxiety would probably lower immunity. And it does. But it seems like, at least in the research, that the, that the emotion <laughs> that is actually the worst for us right now is anger. Hmm. And um, so I'm kind of looking out at, you know, at, at our country right now. And there's a lot of anger. And, and that worries me. You know, that's, yeah. that's not where we should be right now. And so taking your nervines, chamomile, catnip, um, you know, passion flowers, skull cap, or just a few herbs that will sort of temper some of that intense, those intense emotions. And then our bitters specifically also for the liver and that anger pattern. So like dandelion root and um, burdock root, some of those bitters would be really, really nice too. So, you know, those are just sort of like, you know, those are some things that we can do to keep our, our systems sort of even on our nervous system. And then we can be taking adaptogens and immunomodulators. And there's a lot of information out there about like echinacea and astragalus and reishi are just sort of the top three that I'm kind of spotlighting for my students right now. Um, and then there's the whole crazy thing about elderberry. I don't know if you've seen a lot of that on on Facebook and all over the web. <laughs> it's uh, uh, that it um, causes an immune overreaction. Yeah, cytokine storm. So, so I've been following this and following a lot of my elders and and herbalists who've been um, looking and researching this. And and really, what it seems like is that there have been some instances where elderberry can overactivate the immune system, as you said and create increased amounts of cytokines, which then can damage healthy tissues. And so the weird thing about COVID is that um, it, seems to do, it seems to do that. It seems to trigger the immune system and the immune system is overreacting to the virus in some ways. And actually then the body is damaging itself through the cytokine storm. And so the concern is that because this has been shown in some models and only in, um, it seems like this only happens in some people that already have some maybe autoimmunity at their kind of underlying autoimmunity that the elderberry has that effect. So across the board for herbalists, what they're saying is as a general preventative, take your elderberry syrup. It's still one of our best antivirals and immune boosters. If you actually get COVID, if you actually have a fever and you're having those problems, then you stop taking it. Hmm. So that's that's kind of at least in the moment what, what I've heard and what I'm telling my students, um, you know, as a general, you know, general way of viewing it. Um, and, and I think that that's a really balanced approach because, you know, we're, we're taking the science into consideration, but we're not getting afraid of this plant and using it actually when it's um, at its best. That's awesome. And I think that I think that that kind of information, really clear um, information about 
what to consider is is important right now because there's so much like pseudoscience and mm -hmm. just opinion of people have the thing that they like and they trust and like science the, the gift of science is that it's fluid like we keep learning and we keep changing uh, in order to have the most uh, correct and appropriate information and so um I really appreciate that about your work, especially. Um, it's so necessary. Thank you. Yeah, and it's fun. <laughs> like, it is like fun. It's, it's fun. I mean, science is fun. I mean, it's, it's you know, like you, you end up going down lots of rabbit holes. But, you know, I think as long as you don't lose the, the, the anchor in the world of spirit, like you can go down those rabbit holes and not feel like you're selling out. It's like, it's just more information. And so I'm, yeah, I just, I think it's, I tried to reframe it for people and, and make it simple so that it's not something scary that feels like, yeah, that it's like, you know, out of, out of the realm of understanding or that it's somehow being, you know, it's somehow being used against you. Um, I think, you know, that's the downside, I think, of a lot of the science, the way that things are, are framed in the scientific world is that they're really kind of talking to the elitist top people who understand, you know, microbiology and like most of us are like, <laughs> I don't know what that is. <laughs> so yeah, it's, um, you know, I think there, there could be definitely some work on that in that area as well. Yeah, beautiful. So for listeners who are feeling inspired after this conversation to start exploring herbs um, on their own, what is a good way to begin? Yeah get outside. I mean, the simplest, cheapest way is just to get outside and just sit with the plants. And um, there's a great free app called um, Picture This. You can download it onto your phone and it will help you identify plants. So if you're, you know, just go on a walk, see what you're attracted to or what pulls you to it, you know, figure out what it is and then do some research into it. And that's a great way to just start getting, you're getting your senses engaged and start to work with the plants just right as they are. Um, there's also one of my favorite books that I tell, you know, beginners and interested students to buy is uh, Matthew Wood's book called um, The Book of Herbal Wisdom. And it's just a great starting point because the first few chapters just sort of outline what is herbal medicine? Where does it come from? What are the energetics? What is basic chemistry? It kind of gives you an overview. And then he tells these just incredible stories about the plants and, um, and how they've been used and how he's had experiences with them. So I find it to be a very nice kind of full complete book for beginners. And then beyond that, um, just, yeah, looking for maybe if, if you're more interested, trying to find a teacher or a program that speaks to you and, and diving in. And, you know, that's another great way to also just, yeah, keep, your, keep yourself filled up with, with new inf information and material. That's awesome. And at the end of this interview, I will uh, have a link to Ashley's website so that if you're curious to learn more or perhaps even take some classes with her online, um, that information will be available there. Thank you. Do you have any final words of wisdom for us in this time of pandemic? Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, I think what I keep coming back to, and this, this, is, this is something that is, um, was taught to me by one of my yoga teachers, Hari Kirtana Das, um, that has been so helpful as I worry about germs and my children and, and just sort of all of the things that can cause anxiety is a very, very ancient yogic principle. And it's just very simple. It is, you are not your body. <laughs> and I swear that is, that has saved my life so many times. Um, because when I remember that I am not just this body, um, when there's something beyond this body that I am, so much of the fear, so much of the anger, so much of those things go away because um, this is all very temporary and we'll all get through it in, a, in different ways. Um, but to me, that phrase has just been such a touchstone, um, you know, even for my children looking at them and saying, you are souls. And if you leave your body, it's, it's okay because it's just your body, it's not you. And so that just, you know, it, it erases so much of the worry and the fear and, and um, yeah, it's been extremely helpful. Beautiful. Thank you so much for that bit of wisdom. And so thank you so much for taking this time to share from the wealth of knowledge that you carry about the green growing world. Um, 
and the ways that it can be our medicine, um, mind, body, and spirit. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a real joy to be here with you. Thank you so much, Ashley. And for our listeners, um, just a reminder that we have a new interview that comes out each Friday, and you'll be able to continue learning and growing and connecting with amazing minds and hearts each week. Thank you so much.